This is your world So let's vow to make it a better place Let every heart that needs to know Your love is here to stay Ooh, It's time we live a new life Ooh, Let us love shine bright in you We're saved by His grace So we embrace your love today We are changed St. John 9 one and two. That whole attitude about suffering and persecution and going through stuff, that stuff got to change. We're going to miss out on something that God's trying to do in our lives. All right, now watch this. And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. The guy was born blind. Now, notice this. And his disciples asked him, saying, notice, notice the question they asked. Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Do you see the bigger picture here? You saw what they just said? He was born blind. Somebody had to cause this. He was born blind. Somebody had to sin in order for this to happen. The same attitude has come to where we are today. So, you get corona, you get cancer, you lose your job, you do this. Christian people will say, you must, you must be sinning. You must be sinning because this happened to you. Just like they said, who sinned? Because he was born blind. The reason why he's born blind, there had to be some sin. That's, you know how much bondage that puts people in? We don't get to see the glory of God's grace because there is so much bondage, they're, all, they're actually afraid to share what they're going through because people see it as sin. You, you must be sinning. Oh, well, I, I lost my job. What did you, what did you, what, what sin did you commit to lose your job? You never thought that God had to get you off that job because he had a better one planned for you, but you wouldn't move. But every day you thank the Lord for your new job. Thank you for my new job. Thank you for my new job. He's like, well, God, dog, I'm going to give you a new job. You won't move. <laughs> Afraid to tell people if you get the flu. How you? What's going on? Oh, nothing. Oh, hallelujah. Praise God. Why are you lying? I see that snot coming down your nose all on your mustache. You talking about there ain't nothing wrong. I understand you trying to speak faith. I get that. But a lot of it is fear-based. You're, you're, you're trying to speak faith because you're afraid that somebody will ask, did you sin in order for this flu to come on you? Oh, and I don't talk about the coronavirus. Oh, no. I ain't telling nobody I had nothing because people are going to judge me. You must have sinned if God is your uh, uh, healer and, 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 and if you Psalms 91 equipped then why you get the Rona? <laughs> if you saw 91 equipped, you must have sinned to stop God from doing that. That is doctrinally not sound. Amen. The issue is not what you get. The issue is after you get it, you went through a trial and somehow you came out with the praise and the glory and the honor. You came out depending more on God than you've ever depended on God. Because, honey, there's some things that I have gone through. When I came out, I depended on God more than ever before. I realized I couldn't trust man. I realized I couldn't trust money. And I, 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 when I came out of that, the impurity of the dependence upon self had been burnt off, and my faith had been purified where all I know is Jesus did that. Kind of like that other man. He says, he says, I was blind, but now I see. And they said, well, did he do it on Sunday? Did he do it here? He said, look here. All I know, all I know, I don't know nothing about y'all religion. I don't know what y'all trying to say about this man. All I know is that I was blind, but, but I can see now. But we, we do stuff like that. And then 
we create the atmosphere of phoniness. We have perfected phoniness, phoniness in the church so much. You just, it's just crazy. You have to be phony in order to appear faithful. And what I'm trying to get you to see is God is faithful. God is the one that's faithful. And I'm going I'm to be, I'm going to have faith in his faithfulness. He's never going to let me down. I'm going to depend on him when I ain't got nothing. I'm going to depend on him when I got something. I'm going to depend on him when I'm, when I'm on top of the ditch. I'm going to depend on him when I'm in the ditch. I'm going to depend on him when I got provision. I'm going to depend on him when I don't have provision. I can never turn the attention on myself and give myself the glory. I have to give God the glory for everything. Why? Because I'm dependent on him. I've got to burn away my dependence on myself. Amen. Wow. I start to tell you, say amen or owe me. Amen. And then look what he says. He says his disciples asked him, verse 2, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And what did Jesus say, verse 3? Check it out. He said, uh, he said, neither. Jesus answered, neither hath, neither hath this man sinned nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. He said, nobody sinned. He said, this is an opportunity for me to show out. It's an opportunity for his mama and daddy to depend on me and for me to show out. Won't you give God an opportunity to show out in your life? I don't know about you, but I want to give God opportunities to show out in my life. And when he does it, I don't want to turn, you know, Benedict Arnold on him. I want to say, this, this is the Lord's doing. Yeah. Well, how you do that, huh? Well, you know, first of all, here's my recipe. <laughs> people, people look for every reason to brag on themselves. And, and, and when grace came, God said, you're saved by grace not of yourself, so that no man can boast. He says, you didn't do nothing. It was me. I'm the reason why you were able to get saved. But men still love looking for opportunities to boast. Amen. All right, let's get started here. Luke 22, verse 42 through, uh, Luke 22 and verse 42. And let's read it in the NLT. Here is Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. And through intense suffering in Gethsemane, Jesus' unfailing dependence on the Father was expressed in these, these words, not my will, let thy will be done. His unfailing dependence on the Father, not my will. Isn't that the problem with a lot of us? We're always praying to God about our will. And when you really depend on God, you're going to move from your will to let your will be done. I trust you. I trust you. I trust you know what's better for me than I know for myself. Not my will. He expressed his unfailing dependence upon God. Look at this, verse 42. He's in the Garden of Gethsemane. He says, Father, if you are willing, please take this cup of suffering away from me yet I want your will to be done, not mine. <sighs> a lot of people don't, don't realize how much Jesus suffered in that point. It's just seeing everything he had to go through. He had just a moment there where he was in that flesh, and he said, Lord, take this cup from me. Take this cup of suffering from me. That's probably the prayer that most Christians would pray when they're going through stuff. Take this cup of suffering from me. And when I saw this, I'm like, Lord, so many times I've been trying to get you to take the suffering from me, remove the thorn from my flesh. And I got to trust in your wisdom that the thorn is there for a reason and that I'm going through this for a reason. And I don't know why, but I'm going to trust you do. And a lot of times you go through things a lot easier when you turn your trust on him and depend on him. Because a lot of us can look back 10 years ago and we see things with much clarity now.
And we realized if certain things hadn't happened the way they happened, maybe would not, we would not have been able to take that next step or do what, what we need to do. Now, I understand self-inflicted stuff, but you know what? I, I understand about self-inflicted, even if it's self-inflicted. By the time that self-inflicted pain come back on you, it's still going to be kind of changing your mind a little bit, like, I don't think I need to do that no more. Father, if you're willing, please take this cup of suffering from me. Yet, here's a change. I want your will to be done. My will is to take the cup from me. Man, I had to look at this. My will is to take the cup from me. My will is, oh, God, don't let, make them stop saying nasty stuff about me. My will is, make, oh, God, make, make everything fine. Make, I don't want to have no more church trouble. <laughs> it's like, no, 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 wait a minute. Uh, okay, hold up with the cup. Let your will be done. I depend on you. And I'm figuring because I depend on you, part of my depending on you should be able to accept your wisdom to allow this thing to happen to me in the first place. I realize some of the stuff that I went through prepared me for today, prepared me to preach the very message of Paul. Paul was persecuted so bad for this message, and it hadn't changed. It has not changed at all. And the fact that I'm so peaceful and cool and calm about people shutting me off and shutting me down and we don't want to hear what you're saying, that's just heresy and da 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 And I'm sitting there, I'm like, can't you read? It's right here. Have you ever been like that? Like, can't you just read? See? See, you wonder, do you really believe the Bible? Yeah. Wait, read? You see that? Read? And when I first started preaching the message of grace, and some of you remember, I would go over like 40 scriptures, read this, and go read this, because I, I had to first of all prove to you it, wasn't in, it was in the Bible and I wasn't making it up. Then you had to go back, back and reconcile in your mind, oh my God, I didn't know that was in the Bible, and you got to reconcile it with what you learned. I, not, my, not my will, God. He declared his dependence upon God. With that statement, not my will, but let yours be done. How many of you are willing to adopt that in your life where you come to this place in your life where you say, not my will, let your will be done? How can you brag when you pray that prayer? And then when everything turns out right, how can you talk about how smart you are and how awesome you are when you know that it was a simple decision on your part to say, I depend on God? How can you do anything else but give him the glory because of what he's done? I know this thing's coming to an end. I know this world's coming to a close. It, all the signs are just so right on. You can almost kind of predict, kind of win, and where you see it down to a T. And my attitude is, I still got some time to get this message out. And then you got this pandemic thing going on. Well, we can't let you in this country. We can't let you there. Thank God for technology. I'm still getting in there. I'm still getting in there, praise God. I, I, I looked up after one week on, on those morning confessions that we're having daily, oh, 200 and some thousand people was on there. I'm like, see, God know what he's doing, but I don't know how to get, I don't know how to reach that many people. I, I, I can't, let your will be done, God, let your will be done. I don't know how to do that. I didn't even know how to turn on a computer until the pandemic hit. But when it comes to reaching God's people, when the gospel is on the line and people got to get it, if somebody come back from space and tell me we went to Mars and they got people on Mars, then I got to start believing God for a space shuttle because those people or whatever going to need the gospel of grace preached to them, and we got to figure out how to get a ministry started there on Mars. That's why I am. I'm going 100 miles with my hair on fire because I don't know when he's going to break through the cloud, but when he breaks through the cloud, I want to be able to say, I gave it all I had in depending on you. Hallelujah. 
And I want to hear him say, my good and faithful servant. <laughs> faithful servant. A lot of people forgot about that. A lot of people don't think it's going to happen. Faithful servant. Well done. I asked the Lord, I said, you know, you know, I thought I was ready to just get out of here. Because I was looking around at the world, I'm like, these people done lost their mind. They're crazy. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. And then I thought, man, they need the gospel preached on. I'm seeing stuff that I have never seen before. I've gotten close to some of these revelations, but not to the, to the precision of knowing whole Bible, declaration of independence from God, declaration of dependence on God. Huh. Now go back and read your whole Bible, and you see it everywhere. Who depend on him? Who didn't? And then Jesus showed up as the perfect illustration of how to live life depending on God, where he declared, I can't do nothing without him. So could it be that suffering is God's method under grace for perfecting and purifying faith? For perfecting and purifying faith. By the faith of Jesus Christ. We live by the faith of Jesus Christ. So by the faith of Jesus Christ, I, I have faith that I'm healed. By the faith of Jesus Christ, I have faith that I'm delivered. By the faith of Jesus Christ, I have faith that I'm the righteousness of God. But I rest in the faith of Jesus Christ, and my rest is my faith that I believe what he believes. Amen? Now, let's, let's look at something. We're going to talk about the three trials, obviously not today. We're going to talk about the, the trial of Peter, the trial of Paul, and we're going to talk about Abraham. The trial of Peter, Peter's trial of faith, Paul's trial of faith, and Abraham's trial of faith. And you're going to see how in each one of those cases, uh, God was perfecting them. Now, here's where all this is coming from. This will really sell it. First Peter chapter 1, 6 through 7, let's go into King J, then the NLT. It is the trial of faith. It's the trial of faith that will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus is revealed to the whole world. That day is about to come. Don't you just sense you're living in the last days? It's just weird. It's just weird stuff, right? It's, I remember years ago having a dream that the dome was empty, and I never, I knew, I didn't know what it was. I woke up and said, what happened? And it was the pandemic. And for a year, I preached in empty seats. And, and then, you know, we came back and, and, and you know, the, the church is doing real well. All right, watch this. Wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be. Wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be. You are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold and, and, and that perishes, though it be tried with fire, might be found under praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Now, let's look at that in the NLT. So be truly glad there is wonderful joy ahead, even though you must, you must, you must endure many trials for a little while. These trials will show that your faith is genuine. Mm. It is being tested as fire tests and purified gold. Though your faith is far more precious than the mere gold, so when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise, it'll bring you glory, it'll bring honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. Now, what is he saying here? 
It is the trial of faith, not of works, nor of accomplishments for him that will bring you much praise. The trial of faith is going to bring you much praise and glory and honor. Not your works. Your works are not going to bring you praise, glory, and honor. Your accomplishments for God is not going to bring you praise, glory, and honor. But it's going to be the trial of your faith, the trial of faith that gets rid of the impurities of, 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 of having confidence in yourself that will bring forth praise, glory, and honor when Jesus is revealed. We've got this warped idea about works. And all we're looking to do is to accumulate a bunch of works that we're saved so we can go to heaven and think we can say, look at everything I did. That's not right. Let me show you something that was mind-blowing. Look at John chapter 8. Saint, excuse me, St. John chapter 6, verse 28 and 29 in NLT. St. John chapter 6, verse 28 and 29 in NLT. I thank God that by the Spirit of God, he leads and guides us into doing great things for people. And I thank God that we do a lot of great works. So certainly there's nothing wrong with doing good works and sharing folks, but look what the Scripture said. These two guys or, that the Bible is referring to, they had just come from the miracle of, of the loaves and the fish, and they saw it multiply and saw everybody being fed. And so they came to look for Jesus, and he was gone, and they decided to just, let's go find him. And he talked to them, and then they said, they replied, we want to perform God's works too. We saw what happened with the bread and the fish. We want to perform God's works too. That's a pretty true statement, right? Oh, I remember in my, my ministry, I want to perform God's works too. I want to do miracles too. Look at how Jesus replied to this. Jesus told them, this is the only work God wants from you. So he's getting ready to tell you the only work that God wants from you. Believe in the one he has sent. I, I, that blew my mind. That's a work? Oh, you better believe it. He said, this is the only, he said, this is the only work I want from you, for you, from you. And we still have belittled believing in exchange for performing. I got to do something. I got to do something. I got to do something. You know, your, your belief in Jesus is, you, you're going you're to obviously be doing something as the Spirit of God leads you, but you're seeking performance over believing. And he said, this is the only work I want from you. Believe in the one he has sent. Believe in Jesus. And we don't.